We're back. Caleb Knight, Andrew Capone, final Road to the Derby video. We are in our wild card race here, Caleb. We got uh, 20 points available here. Uh, it's It's been quite the trip so far. Um, we've had some really good winners. We've had some great exactas. We've uh, missed some chalk. Uh, before we start on this, uh, this last wild card race here, any thoughts about last week's races? Anything you took out of it, uh, especially that Wood Memorial, seeing early voting go down like that in the final 16th? Yeah, I thought we had a, a great slate of races last weekend. Uh, it's a little disappointing that we're coming to an end, but we still have the Derby ahead of us, which is exciting. Uh, I thought the Wood Memorial was a strong race. And I know that in the past, people, in recent past anyway, people have sort of scoffed at Kentucky Derby horses coming out of that aqueduct series of prep races. But I thought that early voting and Mo Donegal both ran big races there. I think Watching that race live, I guess to me, it looked like early voting was just fatigued and kind of got tired and did have a bit of a pretty comfortable trip on the lead. But going back and you know, looking at the numbers, I mean, it's incredible how quickly Mo Donegal ran that final eighth of a mile or final, you know, two furlongs, really. So I don't think that uh, I'm not I'm not sour in early voting. I think Mo Donegal just really uncorked a big rally there. And given those two run styles, I think I'd still take early voting in the Derby, but uh, they definitely have some questions about the distance now. But yeah, I thought it was a great series of preps and a, a great lead to the uh, lead up to the Derby in general. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I, the one thing I will take away from that um, that Wood Memorial was just the ride on Wodonagal. I mean, talk about saving ground. Historically, you know, people always shy away from those aqueduct races and the derby preps, and they always say, well, they're run on slop, they're running the snow, they're running. Well, this was a very clean race. I mean, the, the track was, was pretty clear to, for the most part. And just the phenomenal ride saving all that ground and just had that last corkscrew there to, to really get him in the last 116th. But I did think early voting did all the work there, and Wodonagal just made up, uh, saved all the ground tipped out and just gave, came right by. So nothing to take away from it. Uh, I think that early voting is still a horse I'm going to be interested in when we get to that Derby running stop. I did hear Chad Brown is not necessarily 100% in yet. Uh, he is going to see uh, one or two works before he makes a decision. He might point towards the Preakness, which he's done in the past. So let's see what goes on there. But this week we are down in Keeneland for the Lexington, a wild card race here with only 20 points available for the winner. Grade three going one and one sixteenth of a mile over that fast Keeneland dirt. I'll start us off here with the number one Midnight Chrome. 20 to 1 on the morning line. We'd need to see, uh, we'd need a win here to get into the gate. A place and show wouldn't be enough. It's right on that cut line. A chrome baby out for service with Jose Ortiz up. The horse's only derby points, that which the two only two derby points, come from a third back in the Remsen in December 2021. Um, this race turned out to be pretty formful, that Remsen. You know, uh, Zandon came out of that. Last week's winner of the Bluegrass, Modonigal, winner of the Wood Memorial. Um, so we saw two big winners come out of that. Maybe that's a formful race. I mean, we, we, we've talked about these aqueduct races time after time that winners keep on coming after. Maybe it's they don't win at Aqueduct, they win somewhere else. Uh, the rail has been pretty good, so it should give it a little bit of lift for this uh, for this 20 to 1. It's a long shot, though, but uh, I'm going to need a, a, need that price to hold and most likely a horse I'll use underneath. But uh, one more, but <clears throat> Midnight Chrome here is definitely a horse I will take a second look at as we get close to that starting gate. Any thoughts on the 2 and the 3 here? Yeah, Andrew, and I think with number 2 in due time, I think that this is a horse that I expected would have been the favorite here. Um, and it looks like he's he's about the second choice. And so he, he's going to be vying for favoritism, I'm sure. Uh, this is a horse that I think makes a lot of sense in this race. He really hasn't done a whole lot wrong in his career. I mean, he's got two wins from four starts. He ran a good second in the Fountain of Youth. You do have to take that race with a grain of salt because he did create some, some trouble that day in the Fountain of Youth with one of the signature Paco Lopez uh, moves here that led to a couple horses clipping heels and going down. But um, so it's fair to question, you know, perhaps how that race would have turned out differently had he not made that move. But the way he was finishing up, I still think that this was probably the second best horse in that race. He had a lot of energy left at the wire. We know simplification, that's your derby horse. And we know that that's a nice horse so I think in due time is a very major player in here, especially given the inside draw and the lack of apparent pace in this field. The number three, we all see it. Uh, this is a horse that I have probably a harder time coming around on. He, he kind of toiled for a long time after breaking his maiden, has seven starts already, is only a three-year-old here in April. So he, he is more heavily raced than a few others. And up until his last race, he really didn't have any 
figures that were fast enough to make him a contender in this spot. But that last race came back pretty quick. He got a nice speed figure that day of a time form US figure of 107, which is competitive in this field. But that was such a big career top for him. And it, it seemed like it kind of came out of nowhere. I, I can't really understand. It, there was no blinkers. There was no cutback. There was really nothing that I can really see that led to that. So for me, I'm a little bit skeptical that he's going to be able to repeat or move forward off that effort. And it's probably a little more likely to regress. But if you do believe that he repeats that, you know, you're getting Saez up and maybe he just tries to send for the lead here. I think you'll get a good price. Any thoughts on number four, Ethereal Road? Yeah, I mean, going back to the three, yeah, we all see it. It's not happening. That's 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 what I saw as soon as I saw that horse. I think that you're 100% right there. That's going to be a, some sort of top. Ethereal Road here, uh, back off seven days rest, um, just ran last week in the Bluegrass. Uh, D-Wayne Lucas horse only needs a few points to get into the Derby. 20 points so far, so second and third could be enough here. The horse was flat in the Bluegrass a little bit, and it was disappointing. Um, you heard D-Wayne Lucas's comments, and he talked a little bit about the trip. Uh, horse got smashed by a 50 to one trademark at the top of the stretch. Sort of got turned sideways, never really got back into it. Uh, but D-Way must have some sort of confidence to run him back off this six days. Um, the horse does fit the bias extremely well for the Lexington Stakes. If you check out the HRN article that came out this past Wednesday, you'll see that the running style for the Lexington is a defiant pattern. It's a, such a pattern. It, it's sort of scary. And trying to figure out why it exactly happens might be a little hard to, but it keeps on happening, so I'm going to run with it until it breaks its leg. Uh, last four of, uh, of this race, winners came from greater than seven lengths behind at first call to win. And of the last 16, 10 made up more than four lengths first call to win. So it's definitely a race where on a really fast Keeneland track, you see some sort of closer bias. It could be some sort of timing of the year, horses getting tired, or as as it's stated, you know, horses here are – need just a couple points most of the time to get into the derby. So trainers sometimes are just send them and we can hopefully hold on for second and third. And that's why you get this passing late. Um, this race seems to be a, a closer's race and Ethereal Road is a closer. And if he runs true to form with that late time form number, uh, I think there's an opportunity. He could be right there and and maybe win it. Um, so at eight to one, this is a horse I'm going to definitely use in my tickets. Uh, moving on to the five, Howling Time. Um, I don't think this is Dale's year. Uh, I saw Dale when we were down at the Holy Bull, and it didn't seem like he was very positive on much. Um, the horse has fallen off of form as a three-year-old. Terrible ninth in the fountain of youth showed absolutely nothing. Um, his street cent stakes win came from a race that hasn't really shown much promise and many horses come out of. Talamo and Romans are 12% this year. The horse has zero points. Even if he wins, he would need at least four deflections to get into the race. Um, this is going to be a toss for me. Uh, what did you think of the six and the seven here? Skate to heaven and major general. Sure. So skate to heaven, number six, uh, 30 to one on the morning line. And you'll probably get a large part of that price. He feels a little overmatched here in this field. He took four tries and before finally breaking his maiden last out. But I did take a harder look at this horse just because if I can ever make an argument for 30 to one, I like to try. And I guess if I don't think this horse is a very likely win candidate, he would need a lot of things to go his way. But this is a horse that's headed the right direction in his form cycle. And there's a lot of horses in here who I think have either coming off big blast out tops or that are, you know, have big tops that have not really shown up lately, like Howling Time, for example. I think this is a horse that's at least going in the right direction and it's kind of stepped forward in each race. So I think if he takes another step forward, he could get a piece of this, especially coming off the pace like we talked about. But I think a win is probably a little bit unlikely here. He does feel a little bit in over his head and it doesn't really seem like these Oakland shippers have done particularly well at Keeneland so far this meet. Number seven, Major General. So this is a horse that is surprisingly to me anyway, four to one in the morning line, and I don't want any piece of Major General at four to one. Uh, this horse can beat me. He probably won't be on any of my tickets. Uh, he was undefeated going into the Tampa Derby. He was not really respected in that race as he was you know, sent off at you know, nine to two. And he didn't run a step at all. Um, he stumbled out of the gate. You know, Maybe you give him a pass for that, I guess. But for me, I'm not really a believer in his two wins either. I mean, Iroquois is historically not a very good race when it comes to producing Derby hopefuls. Uh, this feels 
somewhat like a desperate move here to just try to, you know, get some purse money and maybe sneak into the gate if there's a few defect, uh, defections. But this is not a horse that I really want any part of. All right, let's move to number eight, Strava. So what do you think to, of him, Andrew? Moving to date here, Strava, Dallas Stewart, uh, Miss Inst Into Mr. Baby. The Stewart trainee has made mistakes, but really done nothing wrong. And I know that sounds weird to say. Um, broke through the gate at Fairgrounds and finished a solid third behind the Arkansas Derby winner. Cyber Knife, uh, 56 days ago. That was uh, late February. Uh, also the only horse in the field that's won at Keeneland going back to six for a long race in the fall. Um, but that's where it stops for me on the positives here. I think that 15 to one might be a little shallow. You might need a, need a little bit more for me to be interested. Um, horse would need to take quite a step forward here. And this is a horse that wants the lead. And I think there's going to be two or three people that are going to go for the lead. Um, I see this horse probably getting up, burned up uh, by the top of the stretch. Um, but this might be one of those horses that you key in your in third and fourth in your tries and supers um, as somebody that just holds on for a piece. But this is this horse is probably most likely going to be a pass for me here. Um, I really just don't see it. And again, I'm, I'm looking at these horses with zero derby points and thinking to myself, they would need to win and need three to four, maybe five deflections to get into the gate. So something I'm going to be more interested in is the horses that have the opportunity. I think there's going to be a little more send there. Uh, moving to the nine Tommy point here, um, Brad Cox trainee, and, and you know he's trying to get something in the, in the gate here. Uh, 40 points so far uh, on the Derby. Um, second place finisher behind Tis the Bomb in the Jeff Ruby stakes. Uh, has the best time form U.S. figure in the field. The bias fits the running style, and he gets flow in the irons. A few negatives. The horse is only one on synth. Uh, the, the two, the lone dirt start he's had was a fifth place finish at the Risen Star, where he really just passed the tiring horses. I wouldn't say he ran a good fifth. Um, this horse is probably going to be short. It's going to be most likely, to, in my mind, the second or third favorite on it. Um, possibly the favorite, but I agree with you on that, that too earlier. So it's going to be up there. It's going to be short. Just, again, I'm not interested in Brad Cox horses this year. I said it from the beginning. I talked about this during the draft ruby stakes. I talked about this during the Risen Star. I've talked about this in multiple races. I'm just going to pass on Brad Cox horses for now. Um, I just don't necessarily see it. So this is this horse is, is going to be a horse I hope takes a lot of money, but I'm going to I'm going to pass on. So let's move to the outside here. We're getting to some horses that are going to be pretty far outside, and the bias so far has been not too favoring to outside horses at Keelan. What did you think of this uh, dash attack with Pratt up, who uh, seems to be understanding a little bit about the bias here at Keeneland? Yeah, it sure seems like Flavian Pratt can do nothing wrong lately uh, at Keeneland. So he's he's continued his tear ever since leaving California not too long ago. Even with the services of Flavian Pratt, I have a bit of a hard time getting to dash attack here. I don't think the Oaklawn preps were very good. I, I would argue that they were probably the worst preps of any of the major circuits across fairgrounds, New York and Florida, and even California, perhaps. Um, I'm just not really impressed with you know, the likes of, you know, Unoho and Newgrange. And I just feel like, you know, Barber Road, none of those horses really jump out at me. This was a horse that was undefeated entering the Southwest and just kind of didn't show up in the Southwest. Uh, and then again, he came back in the Rebel. He didn't really show up there. I find it very curious that they uh, didn't go to the Arkansas. So I'm not sure if there was you know, maybe an injury or something that happened there. But uh, they decided to come here for less points instead, where he doesn't you know, have enough points to make the gate or isn't even close. So uh, to me, this looks like a horse that is, you know, honestly, he's bred to love the slop. I think he took advantage of that in his first two starts when going around uh, one mile. He's not necessarily bred to love, you know, a mile and a 16th. And he, he's better on an off track than he is on a fast track. I think we've kind of seen that. Uh, this is a horse that maybe could hit the board, but he's not one I'm going to be uh, too excited to bet. The number 11, Call Me Midnight. Uh, this horse will always be near and dear to my heart as uh, he made me some money during that LeCompte or uh, when he had that huge uh, upset win at 28 to 1. I don't like this spot for him, unfortunately. I think this is a very nice horse. I think that, you know, I think he's going to be somebody's Belmont horse or something to that effect later on. But to me, I mean, I know the HRN article, it does probably make a case for this horse, given that this race has historically melted down a little bit and gone to closers. But to me, this is a deep, deep, deep closer that has kind of a murky pace scenario to run at. 
I don't necessarily know who's going to send for the lead. So it, it could be Swift, but there aren't really any need the lead types. So I think he's going to be a little bit up against it from a racing flow perspective. I, I mean, you can't really hold the Louisiana Derby against him where that race was pretty much a merry-go-round with Epicenter and Zozos and Pioneer of Medina kind of just rounding off the top three for pretty much the entire race. But uh, again, I just don't think he's going to get that pace that he needs today. You know, I'd love to see this horse in a different spot or in a race that had a little more pace signed on because I do think he's an extremely talented colt, but I have a hard time uh, seeing him get the setup he needs from the far outside post and with the pace the way it is and the short team on stretch. So probably a pass for me, but, uh, but I am interested in this horse maybe down the road. I couldn't agree more there on, on Call Me Midnight. I think this horse is one of those horses that ends up winning like the – Something at Mammoth, whether the, the Haskell, win some sort of summer derby, some big race down there where it just gets that set up and he gets some some cheap speed that goes out in front of him. But he does need that deep, deep closing, as you said. Um, and that's where what brings me to my top pick here. Um, I'm looking at a closer here. I'm a biased player. I definitely want somebody that's going to be coming off the pace. Call Me Midnight's going to be way too far back with that short stress for me to be interesting. Um, I'm going to go with a, a choice here off of six days rest. I'm going to go with Ethereal Road as my top picker. Horse fits the bias, and I think it's an upgrade with Victor. Victor Espinosa comes in for the mount. The bias fits well, and I can find a little bit of excuses in his form. Last couple of races, that bluegrass, if you looked at it, top of the stretch, 50 to 1 shot. Trademark smashed into him, turns him sideways a little bit, takes a little while to get back, and he really never gets back into the great, gets into the race. I think this field sets up a little bit better for him with that late run. Um, he's going to be a little bit closer, obviously, than Call Me Midnight. We watched him, you know, sit six, seven off, uh, and then get tighter to about five off to that top of the stretch of the bluegrass. Um, I'm not going to ever go against D Wayne Lucas with a derby up possibility here. Um, horse already has 20 points and only needs a couple, but I think there's good opportunity for it to win here. Horse gets a nice clean trip. He runs back to that Rebel race, uh, those figs from there. I think this is an opportunity. You get a big price. So I'm going to be on the uh, ethereal road here. I think uh, I'm going to get a little bit less than that morning line of, of eight to one. Um, there's going to be an opportunity. Maybe I'll get six. But uh, I'm going to really, really good hammer this horse here and definitely go underneath with a couple exactas and tries. Focusing on some of those horses I spoke about before that are going to need the lead, but are definitely going to start to fade off as we get in. I think this is going to be a tiring, a little bit of a tiring track. So Ethereal Road here at 8-1 to one is going to be my top choice, and I do not have a long shot for this week because I'm going for a mid price horse there. What did you have here for your top pick? Yeah, I think we're thinking along similar lines here and that this is this doesn't feel like a race that I want to take a short price. I don't – I've already spoken about Major General. I don't really trust him. Tawny Port is going to take money. I think this is a better turf or synthetic horse. That's not really a horse I want to go bet at five to two. I mean, of the short prices, I do respect in due time quite a bit. That's probably a horse that will make a lot of my tickets. But I'm going to kind of follow you and uh, throw one down the field here. And I actually landed on the number eight Strava is my pick and long shot here. Uh, I know you spoke briefly about this horse earlier. Um, it certainly does need to take a step forward here. But I like the way this horse is coming into this race. Lightly raced, has every chance to improve and step forward. Uh, I've only three starts in his career and has improved each one of those. Uh, he adds the blinkers today, and I think he's going to be forwardly placed. I don't necessarily think he gets the lead. I don't know that I necessarily want him on the lead, but I think he gets a real comfy trip because there isn't a ton of speed in here in the event that a horse like you know Howling Time and In Due Time and a few others decide to go for the lead. I think Strava can really tuck in nice and get that pocket trip just off the speed. You know, I thought he ran a nice race last time and he, he's still pretty green. I mean, we talked about he is lightly raced and he's still figuring things out. I mean, he, he broke his maiden at first asking, then came back at the fairgrounds and made up a lot of ground in a six furlong sprint in the slop. That's very difficult to do. Fairground dirt sprints were overwhelmingly won on or near the lead. You know, he, stumbled out of the gate that day. So he even has a built-in excuse as far as, you know, not quite getting the job done. And then he came back next time out. He broke through the gate before the race went off. He probably spent some energy there. He broke from the 10 post. He had a wide trip and he never really changed leads all throughout the stretch. He was beaten by Cyberknife, who you know, isn't necessarily a horse I want in the Derby, but he did come back to impressively win the Arkansas Derby. So I think that you have to give him a little bit of extra credit for, you know, company kept there. So I really think Strava could outrun his odds here. I mean, I see 20 to one in the morning line and I'll be really surprised if I get that, but I would be happy at, you know, 10 or 12 to one with this horse. You know, I'm always a fan of a horse doing anything for the second time. So second time going two turns here, 
should be a little more seasoned. Hopefully the blinkers keep him a little more focused and who better than Dallas Stewart to uh, spring an upset on a Lexington day. I mean, look at us, uh, us two here. We got Dallas Stewart and uh, <laughs> and Dwayne Lucas here, two guys that definitely can spring a price here. Uh, we're both looking at longer price horses here. This should be a, a really good race and a nice finish off to the road to the Derby here. See those last points come in. So this coming Saturday, one and one sixteenth of a mile at Keeneland Racetrack, race number nine, 11 runners going for the Lexington, 20 points available for the Kentucky Derby. This is the final race here. This is the wild card. We thank you for following us through this entire road to the Derby. We appreciate you subscribing and liking our videos. If you can like and subscribe again, uh, we'll be back in about two weeks with our series for the Kentucky Derby. It'll be a multiple part series and we'll go through every single horse, all 20, most likely 22 that are going to be looking at the start possible starting gate at that first Saturday in May. Thanks for listening.